Hi, so welcome to this lecture on the software requirement specifications document. So after we've done all our work, we need to produce a software requirement specifications document. So this SRIS document is the output of the analysis stage. So in this lecture, we're just going to look at what constitutes the software requirement specifications document, what you focus on, what you'll be writing about, and the like. So, basically, we need to understand the requirements, what a requirement is between the customer, and the customer and the supplier. Then we also need to know what is the end, uh, the end product of the requirements or analysis phase, and that is our software requirement specification document. And what is this software, uh, this SRIS? It's a complete specification of what the proposed system should be. So. So you should understand that the SRIS is still a conceptual solution. This is not actually the designed solution. Here what we are focusing on is to show that we have managed to understand the requirements of the user and translated them into system requirements that we now need to design and come up with a system. So this document will show the complete description of the behavior of the system. It's also going to show all the essential requirements of the system as well as its external um, interfaces. This includes its functions, what does the system do, how does it perform, what are its design constraints and its quality attributes. We shall go deeper into that. Then each requirement is also defined in such a way that it can be easy to verify whether it has been achieved or not. And some of the methods that we can use to verify that include just inspecting the system, demonstrating the functionality, analyzing the system using our various analysis methods that we've looked at or testing the actual functionality of the system. So what is the purpose of this software requirements specification document? Firstly, remember it is the product <coughs> of the analysis stage in the software development life cycle. So what the SRIS document basically does is it establishes a, an, an agreement between the user and the supplier and it demonstrates that the, the supplier has understood the user requirements and that the user, the user is satisfied with the understanding that the supplier has of their requirements. So you will find that users will know what they want, but they may not know how it works as a system. At the same time, the developers who can develop a system but not understand how, um, that, how everything works in that problem domain. For example, if it's a medical field, the, the software developer may not understand the medical terms, but so that's where this, the SRS comes into play to make sure that both sides are on the same page as they come to the conclusion of the analysis stage. It is also a communication tool. So it's basically a, um, the SRS is a medium for communicating between your various stakeholders, be they the project management team, your financial team, your executive team, your developers, your users, and any other interested party. The SRS can also be used is the, is the basis on which the design of the system is going to be produced. It can also be used for validating the functionality of the system. So after the system has been developed, you now have to go back to the SRIS and check that the design and the developed system matches the requirements as well as the various uh, design constraints that are uh, outlined in the SRIS document. So as has been said as well, the role of the SRIS is basically to correctly define all the software requirements, but no more. Because it's a theoretical uh, document, it's just now trying to translate the user requirements into software requirements, which will now then be translated into a system during the design stage. It's not, the SRIS document does not um, describe the design, the verification, or project management details. It just works on the software requirements, except where it may need to define some of the design constraints so that as you design, you, you already know that these constraints are supposed to be there. So why do we then need this? Like we said, we need it to be able to understand the user needs. It also provides a reference or validation of the final product. That is, after we've developed the system, we can use it to, to tick our checkboxes that every requirement has been satisfied. It's also a source for producing high quality softwares. So if you come up with a high quality SRIS document, you can also produce high quality uh, software because you would have thoroughly gone through the requirements analysis stage. You would have uh, 
thoroughly gone through the various uh, quality objectives as well as the various um, <coughs> issues around the software requirements required to meet the user requirements. You will find that a lot of errors are discovered after users have tested the system. Now you will find that testing is actually one of the last stages that a software goes through before it actually goes live and is deployed for use by everybody else. Now discovering errors at the testing phase means that the system went through design and development whilst developing something that is wrong. But if you actually uncover these errors at the software requirement specification documentation stage, you'll find that you will not waste any money, any resources, or any time designing a wrong solution or developing and deploying a wrong solution. So in SRIS, which is well done, we help you prevent all those errors and we make sure that everything is done right the first time. So as has been said again, uh, the, a good software requirement specification document reduces development costs, there are fewer errors, uh, fewer changes that are required, and uh, there are a lot of savings that can be done in terms of time and money. So this is an example of some of the um, things that are found in an SRIS document. This is basically showing the first three, uh, the introduction, showing the scope, the purpose, the definitions, your references, and an overview, then a general description of the product, that is the product perspective, product functions, what the user expects, the general constraints of the system, as well as assumptions. Then you get, you get to specific assumptions that you, I mean, specific requirements that are supposed to be in the system, but we'll look at this uh, further on as we look at um, the various requirements of the system. So the SRIS, on top of all the benefits it has, it has got certain characteristics. Firstly, it should be very correct. It should show a lot of correctness in terms of the requirements. So each requirement should accurately represent some desired feature in the final system. So an SRIS, like we said, is basically taking the user requirement and translating it into a feature in the system, thereby maintaining the correctness of uh, the translation from requirement to feature in a system. An SRIS should also be complete. It should have the characteristic of completeness where all the desired features and characteristics are featured in that document. That is, every requirement should be fully met by features that have been created in the system. So there shouldn't be any requirement that is still missing in terms of being fulfilled, but everything should be clearly and fully fulfilled. The SRIS should also be unambiguous. That means each requirement has exactly one meaning. So this helps us avoid errors that may come as a result of different translations of requirements. So every requirement should have one meaning, which means it will only have one translation, which will lead to only one, one solution. Unlike where if it's ambiguous and not clear, people can interpret it in different ways and therefore that will introduce errors into the system. An SRS document should also be verifiable, okay? So there should exist a way of making sure that the software that is going to be developed by the SRIS is actually meets the various requirements. It should also be consistent. Consistent. There should not be contradictions between the various requirements and you, between also the various uh, solutions that are given. It should also be traceable. We should be able to see how the origin of a requirement relates to a software element in, in, in the software. So there should be a link between the feature that is being developed against a requirement that matches that feature. Then there should also, in an SRIS, you should also be able to rank for importance or stability. So this helps you to know which features are the most important in your system and thereby you prioritize those, in the, uh, especially in a case where you may need to do some trade-offs where you need to remove some features for some reason. There you will know which features are most important and which ones are not. So we now come to the components. So those were the features, the characteristics. For it to be called an SRIS, those are the characteristics. These are the components. What do we expect to find within an SRIS? So an SRIS must specify requirements on functionality, performance, design constraints, external interfaces, and quality attributes. So we are now just going to go in depth into these things. So you find that basically an SRIS is looking at your functional requirements and your non-functional requirements. We'll look into that. So firstly, look at our functional requirements. Functional requirements are dealing with the what. What does the system do? So 
a simple way of putting it as well is to say functional requirements are the features that the users use to do their work. So it's the functions that are given to the user. For example, if it's a calculator, the functions of that uh, calculator is to calculate addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. It is. It can calculate using brackets. It can use scientific notation, etc. So the features that the user is going to use are the functional requirements. Okay. These specify all the functionality that the system should support that the user requires. So always remember that functional requirements are for the user. It's the features that the user will say, what does this system do? This system does one, two, three things. Oh yes, so it solves my problem. So I want the system. So those are the functional requirements that should be stated within the uh, software requirement specification document. Then we now move to into non-functional requirements. So non-functional requirements are basically looking at how the system is supposed to function. So with functional requirements, we are looking at what the user requires. But with, uh, with non-functional requirements, we are looking at the environment that the system requires for it to be able to do its job. And all these issues can be covered by the performance requirements. These performance requirements are things like response time, throughput, uh, capacity, etc. So those issues do not affect the functionality, the functions of the system, but they affect how well the system works, how reliable is the system, and how capable is it of actually taking a low, a big load, etc. So non-functional requirements focus on the environment or the operating environment of the system. What does the system require to be there for it to be able to serve its customers well? So those are the performance requirements. Then other non-functional requirements could be design constraints. These are the, like we said, non-functional requirements are how does the system actually function. So design constraints could come in the form of um, compatibility issues with other systems. So you could actually have some compatibility definitions in the SRIS. Then there are also hardware limitations. What kind of hardware does it require? It may not require to run on, on, on any type of hardware, but it may require hardware that supports virtualization or supports multi-threading, etc. Design constraints also cover things to do with reliability, fault tolerance, higher availability, backup of the systems, as well as security. So you find that these issues that we are discussing, reliability, security, fault tolerance, backup, etc., do not affect the user in terms of the functionality of the system. But these issues affect the, the, cap the ability of the system to, pop, to function proficiently. So these things affect how well the system functions in terms of how fast does it deliver uh, output, how fast does it accept output, does it always go down, is it always up, etc. Then we also look at um, the external interfaces. Basically, external interfaces are how are the the other are the people or the hardware or the software that communicate with our system. So these are what we can call our external entities. So we need to look at which people interact with the system, which other syst systems either give information or get out output from our system. And these should all be verifiable through the requirements gathering process. Now, as we come up with an external interface, it's also important to come up with a good user interface where people are going to interact with the system. So we'll look at user interfaces in a different lecture. So in a nutshell, these are the various non-functional requirements that a system requires. So if it's our calculator, our calculator should have the ability to calculate <coughs> addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, should be able to do scientific notations, it should be able to last, it should be able to um, perform other types of computations that you want mathematically. So those are the functions, which are the functional requirements. Now when you talk of the non-functional requirements, which uh, it's everything else that has nothing to do with the functions. So if you look at our software quality attributes here, if you look at correctness, what that's basically saying is the system should be able to produce correct information, no matter what, okay? So it may be able to add, but it may add wrongly. So we want it to be correct. It should be reliable. That means probably our, our, our um, cal calculator should be able to switch on within a second. Our calculator should be able to last its ba battery life for probably six months or more. 
it should also be efficient which means we should have our buttons arranged in a certain way that allows us for easy uh, manipulation of the calculator so the arrangement of the buttons does not affect whether the system can add or not but it makes it easy for you to use and therefore it makes it a quality attribute that uh, falls under non-functional requirements there's also the issues to do with usability maintainability verifiability reusability expandability etc so depending on the system that you're using you will find that there are different um, features that the user will require that make the, the their work easy okay these features now we will, will have to satisfy some of these software requirements uh, software quality attributes that are on the screen then your document should also contain a data dictionary which is basically um a collection of data about data okay so it's basically uh these are usually definitions uh structure of data or how data elements are used in the organization for example one word could mean one thing in, a, in one organization but it could mean another thing so when people talk of um when people talk of, of reliability it may mean one thing in a, in a one organization in another in another organization so that needs to be defi defined in the data dictionary so that we we are we don't have ambiguous definitions and we have only one clear definition for each term so in a nutshell our um, sris would contain customer or user requirements our functional requirements our non-functional requirements and all these non-functional requirements can also incorporate performance requirements design requirements and other types of requirements that affect how the system is going to work so we have looked at user requirements um we have also briefly spoken of the system requirements and then we have defined the functional and non-functional requirements to say functional requirements it's what the system should provide for the user to be able to do their work and then the non-functional requirements are basically the constraints on the services or functions offered by the system such as timing constraints development process standards etc so non-functional requirements do not affect the functions of the system but they require the system they are required for the system to be a pleasure to use then there are domain requirements this could include regulatory issues or domain specific knowledge for example in the medical field there could be special special terms or special ways of doing things that need to be incorporated into the system so an example of a functional requirement would be the user shall be able to search either or all of the initial set of databases or select so the user wants to search that's a function that the system has should have a search function the system shall provide appropriate viewers for the user to read documents in the document store so the system the user wants to read so the system should be able to allow this the user to read every order shall be allocated a unique identifier which the user shall be able to copy to the account permanent storage area so the feature is that <coughs> the user should, should be able to copy um this unique identifier to a to another account permanent storage area which could be another database so these are the functional requirements that the user is going to actually use then when it comes to non-functional requirements now as you said it's now everything else that has nothing to do with the functionality so things to do with efficiency reliability portability privacy uh, space usability uh, legislative and ethical requirements etc all those are now non-functional requirements which need to be considered for the system to be either compliant with the law as well as for it to provide a quality service and pleasurable experience to the user so examples of non-functional requirements include for example a product requirement it shall be possible for all necessary communication between a pse and the user to it to be expressed in the standard other character set so this requires is basically saying we want the information to be pro to be um to be expressed in a certain character set but even if it were pre not um expressed in that character set it could still be possible to use the system with a different character set but for some reason they want this specific one then organizational requirements would include system development processes and deliverable documents shall confirm conform to the process and deliverables defined in a certain document so the, the development of the system as well as its maintenance may have to follow a certain process or procedure that has been uh, outlined by the organization then other external requirements could be the system shall not disclose disclose any personal information about customers apart from their name and reference number to the operators of the system so this is now talking towards privacy and security requirements and 
this system does not allow people to see information that does not belong to them. So you find that these are some of the examples of non-functional requirements and there are lots more. Some functional requirements include speed, how fast does it process transactions, how many transactions are processed per second, what is the response time between an event and user feedback, what is the screen refresh time, what are the size of either the documents or size of machine that is required, how easy to, is the system to use, is it user friendly, how much training time is required and reliable, how, is, how reliable is the system, how, how likely is it to go down, um, how likely is it to fail, what is its um, availability time and is the system robust, does it fail regularly, is, can it recover from any failure and is it portable, can you use it on different uh, types of operating systems, different types of hardware, can you use it on different types of um, electronic gadgets. So these are some of the non-functional requirements that do not affect the, function the functionality of the system but affects the quality of use as well as the, um, the user experience of that system. So basically that's what um, a, a software requirement specification document contains. It contains the various requirements that are required by a user and all these can come in different forms. So when you're doing your, when you're coming up with this document, you need to be to make sure that no matter what structure you put it, because the structures can vary from organization to organization. There are certain things that you need to define, especially the functional and non-functional requirements. And you need to make sure that the functional requirements are well outlined, and then also the non-functional requirements are well categorized and well outlined for everyone to be able to understand. So basically, this lecture is about the software requirement specification document, and I hope you learned a lot. Thank you.